Hello and welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piscor. Going to look at Liberatory and Tamburini's Ranks Xerox. Um, kind of a kind of a cult comic. And, and uh, I'm curious about how you learned about this, Ed. But first, I want to remind everybody to like this video, subscribe to our channel, and hit that bell icon. Uh, that'll help mitigate the kayfabe effect for all of you guys who see see these videos and, and rush out to pick up ranks in New York. Uh, you'll be the first people to be notified of these videos, so you can get ahead of the, the group if you uh, hit that bell icon. And in terms of liking and subscribing, it just helps us in the algorithm so that new people can find this video a little bit easier and uh, continue to spread the cartoonist kayfabe message of read more comics. So thank you for your help on that. But uh, as I was saying, Ed, this is one of those comics that I feel like I've always known about um, not always easy to find. You know, they sort of come in and out of print. I think Kevin Eastman was at the head of Heavy Metal whenever this collection came out. I, I actually picked it up in that store in uh, L.A. that had, like, all the Kevin Eastman stuff. But I don't know how this got on my radar. You know, it wasn't like I was huge into Heavy Metal, which is how I think probably most people in America first heard of uh, this this character, uh, do you remember how you came into contact? It was heavy metal. Uh, there was like a price fixing that that sort of was attached to heavy metal magazines when I was growing up. I don't know that it's that way any longer because everybody knows it's like the first two, three years of, of heavy metal that you really want your hands on. So I think the prices have fluctuated. But when I was a kid grabbing just random heavy metals... Uh, it was issue one was fifteen dollars, and every single other back issue was five dollars from issue two forward. And I would just grab ones with the coolest covers, and uh, there would be a ranks story. And and I think of it as ranks, like this ranks Xerox shit is like what it's really called or something, because I just think of it's ranks in my in my mind. Uh, yeah, there you go. <laughs> and. Uh, there would be these collections that would be in the back when they're selling a catalog's worth of stuff. What made me interested in him was that, because <laughs> I am a boy of the, um, you know, the 90s and shit, I just felt like it lo he looked like Guido the Strong Guy uh, in his design, and I like, except better, you know, like it's a better drawn comic. So, like, let me see, let me see what this comic is. And uh, Li Liberatore, he's part of that. Italian crew that um, Mattioli was a part of, man. I forget what they're called, like the Frigidaire, Frigidaire crew. Frigidaire, yeah. Uh, so he's a part of that. And by the way, this is a much asked for video that we're, that we're making right here, man. A lot of Liberatore fans out there in, in the kayfabe audience, man. Yeah. Unanimously acclaimed as the finest illustrator in modern comics. And that Xerox thing, I think originally it was Rank Xerox was the name. Yeah. And it's never in here, but if you look it up online, the the idea is that he's this is a robot and he's built by from like Xerox parts, right? Which I don't know, you know, like something punk related to reproduction and stuff of the Xerox company. But the rank Xerox was a real, I think, machine that they made. Yeah. So they had to change the name. That's how you get the ranks. It's just like how Balrog in Street Fighter Two was uh, was M Bison in uh, Japan, but. They didn't want to mess with Mike Tyson, so right. they made M. Bison the uh, the final bad guy. When we get into this, man, it's the art yes. that, that sings. It's a weird-ass comic to read, and, and it's actually kind of boring uh, in a lot of ways to me, man. But the art on every page is so strong, and in between chapters... I don't know how much time transpires in between one chapter and the next in terms of the original production, but there is a moment where the growth is exponential from one chapter to the next. We'll, we'll see. It's probably around the third the third story here. Yeah, and I think these first start in 1979, I believe, is the first, uh, the first comics. Yeah. And, uh, like, the, like, the first thing that you, you notice is, like, black kind of holding lines on the outline and then just tons of modeling on the inside in just color. Like, that's the hallmarks of the liberatory ranks style well, you know where you got this outline and then just like let him fetishize yeah, the, the musculature rendering like like back rendering underneath the striped shirt also printing this with no margins just kind of like overdose of this art like it's so in your face and so full especially if you're reading this it's just like full vision is is his world 
pretty cool. Pantone pens is what I, I read he draws with. I don't know if that's markers. I mean, I assume that's markers. Um, although there's a lot of texture in these, so who knows? And it could be a combination of, of various media. Um, cyberpunk is something that comes up. Sure. But this is a seedy world. So we have Ranks, who's basically a robot who something's wrong, and he loves Lubna and kind of follows her around. And in order to, uh, I don't know, earn her love, like you see she's thinking of a hypodermic needle here, like he's on the seedier side of wherever he's at looking for drugs and money to make her happy. <laughs> Look at that stuff, man. There's such cool designs and just even background characters, vehicles. This is that like extra level of imagination that that I can't I can't imagine, you know? It's like it's hard enough to learn to just draw. And then you're coming up with whole a whole world and liberatory like he it's a whole vision. It is. It's exceptional. It's extraordinary drawing. Like, you know, you look at him smashed on the ground arm foreshortened, finger foreshortened, like yeah. a folded up wrist on the ground, you know, impossible. And now you're not even just drawing it. You're also doing all the rendering of like your tendons and veins all stretched out there. Highly, highly referenced. Like these, these yeah. figures are, are just highly, like this dude has a million bodybuilding magazines and photographs like all around him because none of it is fake. I see so many other artists in this stuff too, from like Brendan McCarthy, mm -hmm. bits of Jamie Hewlett, totally. Richard Corbin. Um, I think Charles Burns was involved with that Frigidaire Italian collective as well at some point, although it might have been a couple years after after this comic at least. But, you know, like you can kind of see it, I think, in these guys that are going beyond uh, a job or service or, you know, even beyond the storytelling. I love this of him being kicked out of the car and you get to see like the top. They've, they've removed his head as they're talking about it, which is just weird but goes on it's almost the motif as he's wearing hats or getting different hairstyles that go on the top yeah when you have n new action figures you got to have more accessories and stuff and some work better than others <laughs> yes <laughs> so weird yeah it's a weird comic like it um see it's so dumb that they this is that era where they don't want you to know that things are serialized and junk like that so there would be like a rank xerox and then there would be like a um like a prelude, like like a uh, you know here, story so far kind of portion, but they just take it out of this. Yeah, it's real Some, dumb. A lot of uh, brutal violence throughout this this whole series, and uh, I don't know if realistic's the right word, but a lot of graphic violence on the page. <laughs> Look at the colors. That's too. a girl's hand. By Th the way. Think of all the complaining I do about brown. You are not getting brown. Uh, is is there like sitting down to have lunch? No. No, super cool lighting. I was looking at this stuff and just like the compositions are just so so well thought about. It's not easy to, to draw like a, um, a crowd scene like this where a bunch of characters are acting and moving in different ways and they, none of them look static. Yeah, being able to do some movement like that hand crotching that dude, like you get a little bit of movement, just a few of those lines. This kind of style, it's very hard to do that. Yeah, and, and a, lot chaos, it, a lot of it is what your real are. Ah, uh, yes. I always like seeing the blow-up panels. Just, yeah, that's a weird motion. These these figure pieces, man, is just. Let People me see reading his magazines. <laughs> you know, what happens here is uh, this artist kidnaps his girlfriend and wants him to kill this art critic before the artist's big uh, big show opening. <laughs> <laughs> and I think he's a 17-year-old kid, this artist. This is f a funny thing where like there are symbols in his word balloon. This happens from time to time, usually when he's resetting. You know, sometimes he gets shut down or they switch batteries and then he has to be like rebooted. Kind of an odd... Just the whole concept is sort of strange. I don't know what was going on in the Italian comic scene at the time, but this feels like wild stuff for America. I see things like some hard-boiled elements in this. Totally. Because we're going to see ranks uh, basically pushed to his limits, you know, like destroyed and rebuilt. Yeah, like Good a, gun. Like this sex stuff, that's like, you see that in hard-boiled? Yeah. But there are even like, uh, like uh, whip marks across her ass. And I love any time we see the inside of his skull. Yeah, man. Around here might be where, like, the new chapter. Feels like this could be. Yeah. Like, like I think this is the new chapter. Because, like, there is this, like, growth that happens. It's like, 
immediate. And even like the color palette is different. Like he's doing different things here. I do wonder, I was looking for um, like heavy metal printings and stuff because I wonder about the color. It seems like it fluctuates a lot from page to page in this book. And I just wonder like, what do the originals look like? Yeah. How close is this to, you know, whatever Liberatory had in mind? Yeah. You know, in terms of reproduction, because right there's there. an era where heavy metal uh, reprints are not very good quality. Mm -hmm. And this may be in the middle, although this looks pretty good, I think, for the it's, most it's part. It's the same. It, like, yeah, that's how, it's how I remember. Yeah, that back panel's great. Yeah. We're going to see that uh, and stuff. replaced at some point. This is the effect of punching through the door whenever her <laughs> ex-boyfriend shows up. Just milk. He, that that's eyeball a liquid popped. Eye. Yes. <laughs> he popped that fucking eyeball, dude. Yeah, as they're, like, hanging out, she's like, man, you might have you might have gone too, too hard on him. I kind of liked it. <laughs> They say a rising tide raises all ships, Jimmy, and cartoonist Kayfabe, the YouTube channel, is brought to you by the comic books that we make. Uh, we each have a bunch of stuff that's in print, so let's give it a quick run-through, and Kayfabers, if you dig the channel, you dig our comics, Kayfabe affect these comics, let these publishers know that cartoonist Kayfabe is a force to be reckoned with, man. Uh, to begin with, my earliest graphic novel, WYSIWYG, Portrait of a Serial Hacker, follows the history of high technology from the phone system to WikiLeaks. Uh, through the vessel of a single computer hacker, 288 pages. Back to print is the box sets and uh, new printings of each volume of Hip Hop Family Tree, which is my linear uh, sort of retelling of the history of hip hop and rap music. Four volumes in that set. I drew this stuff from 2013 to about 2015. After that comes X-Men Grand Design, where I take the history of X-Men, probably 8,000 pages of material, uh, mostly by Chris Claremont, miniseries, uh, little limited series, things like that, combine it all into one big uh, story, 240 pages of primetime X-Men comics. Get these volumes while they're still in print. There's an omnibus as well. The stuff that I've been putting my energy to lately is Red Room Comics, Murder on the Dark Web for Fun and Profit, The Anti-Social Network. This trade paperback is on stands today, collects the 2021 issues of Red Room, and lots of extra material in the back. Coming up in March is Red Room Trigger Warnings, issue number one, going to be coming out on a monthly basis, every issue completely self-contained. This is the cover that's going to be on the racks in the stores. These are the variants to go along with these comics, including the Jim Rug, by way of Robert Crumb, Zap Comics Zero cover. I'm going to go in reverse order, Ed, and start with Hulk Grand Design. This is my next book that's going to be available in comic shops everywhere starting in March, but you can pre-order it now. This is a retelling of the Hulk history, celebrating 60 years of the Incredible Hulk coming in March, and uh, 10,000 pages distilled down into two oversized issues, and these are some of the variant covers that will be available for Hulk Grand Design, Ed Piscor, Peach Momoko, Marcus Martin, and now, Jeff Darrow. Yes. So, you can order any of these at your local comic shop. These are not retailer incentives, so just let the comic shop know which cover you want. Get all the covers if you want to. They won't cost anything extra. And uh, pick this up in March, but order it now. Next time you're at your comic shop, or call your comic shop. Let them know about Incredible Hulk Grand Design. You can also still get Street Angel, Deadly Scroll Live from Image Comics, A Homeless Ninja on a Skateboard. This collects eight complete stories of the Deadliest Girl Alive and is available wherever books are sold. And The Plain Janes, my 500-page uh, homage to shoujo manga about a group of high school kind of outcasts who start doing public art around their community and get all kinds of trouble as a result of that. Uh, one of the first young adult graphic novels. This thing actually began in 2005 and was just completed in 2019. So you can still pick that up, again, wherever books are sold. Now that we're done paying the bills, back to the video. And this is him juicing up, rips a light post out and pulls out the battery unit and is like, fix me up. And that's, of course, whenever these uh, gang of, of, of toughs decide they're going to, to jump them. And he's basically off, turned off whenever they're uh, switching batteries out, messes up by kicking him in the ass, and that's enough to close the battery door and bring him back online. That's a good image. It feels like something you'd see on a t-shirt or a book cover or something. They, they did license him in a lot of ways, man. I think there were shirts and stuff. These dudes aren't too happy whenever he plops down in their train car. Check back in later. Yeah. <laughs>
the violence is so matter of fact, the way it's presented. I think that part's uh, very funny. Part of that whole feels post-apocalyptic, but I don't know when this is set. Oh, man. I mean, this is the far future. Great textures. And, like, you've seen versions of this where, where, like, you know, there's a pillar with, like, the marble texture got kicked out by dumb kids and stuff. Yeah, it's true. Very lived-in world. Cameras everywhere, too. That's the stuff that Star Wars would get credit for, for for having, you know, some some dust on uh, their, their objects. It's true. Man, look at the drawing just for, like, the staircases and the, the perspective, but not, like, perspective grid. Like, every panel looks like it would take a month. Right. You know? like And, and when you get to know, like, uh, you know, I don't know anybody that does a level of craft like this, but, like, they they figure out their own version of shortcuts. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of have to, but also, like, I don't know. Yeah. How, how much shortcut can possibly exist on here? Like, background, you know, levels of background, like multiple levels of background. I love this Popeye arm wrestling machine. If you look, it's almost like the face is just rounded. Mm -hmm. There's like a glossy highlight. Totally. To show you that that's just smooth. It's not a mouth opening or anything. Right. It's just painted on graphics. Yeah, those little kind of details are great. This guy tries messing with them for a minute, and he just grabs, like, his, his couple some of his blubs. chins. Yeah, <laughs> grabs some of the blubs. Amazing when he goes to a landscape in a house or a car. Like, all of the details work. I just don't get it. I don't either. I don't I don't get how you're so good. It has, like, the straight-up Lacoste shirt <laughs> that, like, my grandpa had and shit. Lost this hat again. Got to lose the hat a lot. Show off the gimmicks. That's a pretty funny hat for him. It works. You know, I mean, you're, you're switching out your hats. That's that, a good one. That's how I think of him with that hat. These pants are just absurd. Yes, yeah, and that's, that's what you end up with uh, on this cover. I mean, you know, cover up the face. You got hawk or animal. That's true. <laughs> that's true and scary. <laughs> now we're getting kinky. Yeah. So he's finally reunited with with his with his love. And uh, in a bulletproof case is what they've got him trapped in because they want him to go to New York and do Broadway uh, play about Fred Astaire and he needs to learn the routine in like 24 hours. And due to being a robot, I guess they think he's up for it. Did you ever read Breathtaker, the DC Vertigo series? Looks just like this version of him because mm. he wears the little round glasses and he's like male pattern baldness, you know, big receding hairline and really looks like that image. That's a pretty great image, too. Speaking of, like, sci-fi, this is running in heavy metal. Yeah. Yeah, it's like, is is there collage elements? I don't think so. That's drawn, huh? Do you think he's influenced by Corbin? That's a good question. Because I feel like Corbin's bigger and you know, big in Europe, you know? it's. Yeah, I don't know. But but you bring up Corbin. Yesterday, Jeff Darrow sent, sent me photos of, in, in the um, 60s, there were these... These novels that were written. Look at this. <laughs> I don't mean to sidetrack you. Well, you know what? It actually is totally appropriate for what I'm about, about to say. There were these novels that were written, and it's like gay sex between like Doc Savage and Tarzan, and and they go on adventures together. And but so it's prose, but it will have like color plates, and it's Corbin. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'll show, it show sounds you like fan stuff. fiction, like the Jinchi or something. It, do, it does, but but it's it's so great because it's like you got these two super butch characters, like ranks, right? Sure. Super butch characters, and then you got them doing gay shit, and that'll just say you know piss off your your homunculus. <laughs> hey man, no, no, what are you guys doing? That's too much. But like this right here, do you think when Liberatory? is painting this or using his Copic markers or whatever you were saying. Do you think he's cracking up the entire day? Like, now I know that these are Italians, Europeans, whatever, and they have different standards of underwear than we do here on the mainland United States. Like, I've seen, uh, that, like, this might be normal in Italy. <laughs> But, Maybe but, it is, but but a giant cyborg robot <laughs> dude dancing Fred Astaire probably isn't. I have a feeling he knows this is entertaining. Tapping those feet together, like <laughs> wouldn't I mean, you love if if you did that page and I come over? Wouldn't you love to have like your stack of like, oh, here are my latest pages, you know? And you're like flipping through, flipping through, and it's like boom. What? 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 <laughs> yeah, I bet you he knew that was a good panel. And then playing the hits, like let's get two. That's really cool looking. You know, like talk about a weird thing to try to figure out a good panel. Like that's amazing looking. Superstar. 
even like uh, he's designing like the giant turntable as part of the stage. A whole set. stage setup. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like it's funny, but you could imagine it like really be in there. And now uh, Rank spies his girl making a move on the dude, the producer of the show. It's when you have stuff like this, man, with these blues and these oranges, and you say Corbin, and I say hell yes. You it's, know, like like purple shadows on pink fleshy skin. I don't know how much you looked at the crowd, Ed, but like all these figures are fully drawn. Yeah, you know, and they're tiny, like they're they're really small. It's that clear line, man. Yeah, I guess so. It's it's uh, interesting to see because these are just basically line drawings compared to this kind of rendering, mm -hmm. like on the same page from the same artist. Of course, he can draw everything. And this is that thing where it, he would probably just do like a splash of color mm. and then. You know, do a little modeling here and there. Like maybe that's the extent of the shortcut. Yeah, maybe. Sometimes you'll see those guys that paint like uh, like a Bisley kind of 2000 AD painters, and they do. I guess they do work faster than I would expect. If yeah. I were trying to recreate that stuff, I would I would be so much slower than some of their techniques. And it is laying down a big piece of color, and then maybe work some drawing, and then come in with detail. Good shot of that back panel. Do you think, like, a lot of people who draw this kind of stuff, like like Bisley, they are bodybuilders. Strong mm -hmm. dude, like Greg Apollo could draw a heck of an arm and stuff. Bodybuilder. I, I've never seen Libertori. Do you think he's a big... you think could he's, be. He's ranks? Yeah, I don't know. Could be. Because it's it, the anatomy is too good consistently to like not have like a really really good set of reference nearby. You know, is he posing himself? Is he posing his friend? Right, studio mate or somebody knows. I have no idea like how much he worked with models or how those models were, you know, how that setup worked. So it's possible he had a guy that was a was a model for ranks cuz why not? If he was working with models with anybody. I'm it's, I think it's safe to say like if if uh if he did it I would be very very extremely fucking shocked. If he didn't have a lot of models. I agree. But the part that's wild to me is it doesn't feel stiff. You know, like for, for being so detailed, like. It's funny you say that because, because, because stiffness to me is a part of liberatory. Like it does feel stiff to me, but like not in a bad way. might be the wrong word. Because I mean, like it feels solid. Yeah. You know, like, like it feels like. Like there's good weight. That's a three. Yeah. Weight 3D. It feels like that's a thing. I think of stiff, stiff as like, um. Yeah, I wonder what the word is that I should be using. Posed? Maybe, maybe posed. I don't know. Because I feel posed to, to, to me, too. I don't know how to explain it. I, I guess certain camera... You know what it might be as a photo reference? Yeah. Because there's a photo reference exactly. thing yeah, where there's yeah. a lens, and the size of the lens definitely distorts. She has the dimples, dude. Mm -hmm. The little thumb, thumb gimmicks. This reminds me a little bit of uh, Frank Whiteley. Mm-hmm. Which, again, European guy. Oh, we didn't comment, but this is one of the funnier uh, headpieces because it's like somebody else's <laughs> head top, like clearly a different haircut. I think that's so funny. <laughs> and he's been running around this whole chapter with, with that. Um, the good uh, Grolix panel, too. So that is uh, the first book in the series, and I think there's actually more than just these three. I don't know if there were more books published, but there's a like collection, and it features more work, I believe, than just these three books. And I had brought this. This was something I got uh, around Angoulême. And it's the same book, but, you know, you can see, like, the color is a little bit different. It's it's also different paper. This is an uncoated paper. But I also like seeing how they cut this stuff up. Yeah. That can be really interesting because, you know, this is, what, a page of comics, but it's three pages in a paperback book. So that's kind of neat to me. And if you actually go through panel by panel, there are panels that are arranged in a different order in this book. And I don't know if it's to fit the page layout or if they're actually, you know, think it reads better once you start, like, kind of chopping this stuff up. Because I've done that before whenever I took a Street Angel comic and made it a webtoon. And it was like, I changed panel order. It was very, a very weird thing. But I do think this printing is kind of neat. A little bit different. Yeah. Yeah, it seems more sensitive. It looks good on uh, uncoated paper, actually. Yeah, yeah, I never does. seen it. I never seen it like that. Man, I'd love to see some of his originals. Yeah, for sure, man. Because because uh, all that work is being done. Like, do those pay if it is markers, those are very stinky markers. <laughs> and like, I I have stuff from the '90s where I use like a black Magnum for like a big piece of black because I didn't really want to waste my one of little course. tube of Higgins, right. you know. And those pages still smell. Yes. Of, the Magnum 
20 years later. So, and they probably bled weird and stuff <laughs> yeah. since then and all kinds of stuff. Like I always wonder with this kind of color, like, does that hold up? That's I mean, a good question. But I don't know about archival markers in the seventies and early eighties. Well, that's a good question, man. Cause I definitely like Prismacolor markers, like do not, you know, they definitely wash the fuck out. Super yeah. cool, man. Wild. So I also brought that just if, if we're looking at like what liberatory stuff we have. This is a Catalan Communications, you know, um, a lot of the European artists that I would hear about. This is probably the first place I would see them. And this is a collection of short stories. The other place that we looked at a piece of his, I love those end pages. I just love that color scheme, was uh, he did a Batman black and white story. And the Batman black and white story, of course, is in black and white. And you'll see a couple of those in here. I like his color so much more. Totally. Than, uh, I guess that's kind of a hybrid there. But, you know, like there's an example of his black and white where you can see a more traditional ink. Line. Yeah, and it and it just looks like, you know, the best of 2000 AD artists, really. Yeah, it's good, but what he does in color is extraordinary. It's like true. it's the kind of stuff nobody does in color, so <laughs> Superman making an appearance. It's like the Bollywood Superman. Flip it on the back, we get a quick glimpse of Liberatory and and uh you know, is there a big musculature behind there? I I'm can't trying tell. to figure out how big that neck is. It looks pretty big. <laughs> so Anyway, first uh, first dip in there. Maybe we'll look at more ranks or uh, more I'd be of happy to. heavy metal work at some point in the future. But happy to get that on the channel because, like, it feels outlaw. It yeah. feels badass. Like The people showed up in a big way for heavy metal issue number one. A lot of people have been asking for us to put ranks under the, uh, the microscope. Here it is, man. Uh, like and share it in a big way. Uh, we get a suitable amount of follower, you know, su suitable amount of views course we're going to take a look at number two dude yeah makes me want to go out and kind of dig in and see what other work he has out there that's available we're going to get some comments uh directly below this video uh in the meantime guys like follow subscribe to the youtube channel hit the bell so that we can notify you whenever we have new vids available once again it mitigates that kayfabe effect if you've never heard of ranks which will be s something that comes up you know like it's always fun uh, introducing people to new stuff especially if they you know came to us by way of wizard magazine or whatever uh you're gonna want to get your hands on this because it's in and out of print all the time uh so you know like and subscribe you hit the bell like you're gonna be able to uh get first dibs on what's on amazon and what's on ebay uh, what else do we have out there, Jim? Uh, pick up Hulk Grand Design. It'll be out in comic book stores in March. You can pre-order that now with your local comic shop, and I encourage you to do that because there are different covers. So let your comic shop know which one you want. It's the easiest way to guarantee you get the cover that you want. But uh, just bring up Hulk Grand Design to your local comic shop. That's what I'm trying to do right now is raise awareness of the book with the uh, comic book retailers. So let them know we sent you. Let them know it's on its way in March, and let them know you want copies. Hulk Grand Design. March is kayfabe month, man, in the comic shops, and furthermore, so is April, uh, because uh, your comic is going to come out one month after the other. Uh, Red Room Trigger Warnings is beginning in March, and is going to be a monthly comic for for four consecutive months. Every issue completely self-contained. Trigger Warnings is the, the 2022 season of Red Room Comics, beginning uh, in March, and uh, you can read those comics on my Patreon before they hit paper. We have links in the link tree directly below this video where you can get to all of that stuff. Support our comics. It keeps the Kayfabe channel going. What else, Jim? Subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e-newsletter at the links below this video. You can also find Cartoonist Kayfabe t-shirts and merchandise at the links below this video. Another good way to support the channel. Jimmy, given those marching orders, we will be on our way. Read more comics.